Hello, my name is Carrie Ann Otaño, and you are listening to Voice Talks. What's up, everybody? I'm your host, Zach Singerman. Thanks for joining me, and welcome to Voice Talks. I'm here bringing you the real perspectives of this industry's finest emerging artists. So listen up, because you'll probably learn something. Today, I'm excited to bring you a conversation I had with soprano Carrie Ann Otaño. We talk about how to navigate the chest register and singing big rep, what life is like as you start to earn professional engagements at big houses, and why she thinks it's a bad idea to make an album of love duets with your romantic partner. Later, I subject her to a game of What the Fach, where we play for a Fach sex change, so stay tuned to see which one of us has to sing an aria from a Fach of the opposite sex. But first, let's have a listen to what Carrie Ann can do in her rendition of Pleure Mes Yeux. Hey, mom, I'm in this great show. You're going to love it. Don't put on any uh, makeup. Don't. Get me flowers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't wear mascara. That's hilarious. Okay, so um, that's right. The Met semifinals as well. So mm-hmm. tell me about that. How cool was that? It was so fun. It was super exciting. Dane had done it actually like three years ago. He was a mm-hmm. semifinalist. Um, or two years ago. Yeah, he was a semifinalist two years ago. So I went to New York with him when he did that. And it's just like, it's a really exciting experience because you, you like coach with someone, you get these tours, you get to go see the shows, they put you up like right across the street. And then the culmination of like this really awesome, super fun week in New York, where a lot of people who actually were in the semifinals were people that I had met before, either at like Glimmerglass or Seagull or just like out and about. Felicia was there from Manus. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was just really fun to like get to meet new people and see kind of old friends. And then the semifinals, like the an, a tier of the balcony is, is full of people. And you're just like singing on the Met stage. And it's so dope. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was really And that, the semifinals concert is with piano, yeah? It's with piano, yeah. And then the finals are with orchestra. Are the judges sitting in the orchestra section or up on the tier with the other? The judges are in the orchestra section. Okay, so did you find yourself performing, playing more towards the judges or playing more towards the tier or just pretending like there wasn't an audience and doing your own thing? I definitely felt like I was performing more towards the tier. I think mostly, um, I wouldn't say I get super nervous before auditions, but it really helps me to, when I think like, oh, my family's here or like Dane's here. Or my mm-hmm. friends. And so I was just like, I don't want to look at Gay Letha Nichols right now. <laughs> like, right. I want to yeah. find my mom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I think it was more of a a reflection of the issues I was having at the time when I was studying with Arthur. And he used to, I think I was doing a lot of like lowering my, my head when I was singing certain uh-huh. things. And he would say, no, look to the balcony. Look to the balcony. That's where your biggest fans are anyway. So, yep. and it, you know, I think it's true. I mean, I think the best seats in an opera house are the higher up you go. I yeah. could care less about what they look like. Just because yeah, it yeah. sounds the best. It sounds it way up, better. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, you want to sing to those people. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. So let's talk about mm, focus sound, chest voice. Let's do a little of both. So I was really, um, obviously I said, impressed with your chest voice and it had, um, it was like a moment of deja vu because I think you we were in um, Amy Burton's performance class together. Mm-hmm. My first semester at um, Manus. Yeah. And for, like, for like a couple of weeks because then I dropped out. Yeah, because you yeah you bailed, right? Where did you go again in I the middle of the year? S- Sarasota I got something? to Sarasota, yeah. That's right. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. Okay, now it's all making sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, 
well regardless i i felt that whole like year i felt i was in so way over my head like the singers around me were unbelievable i like <laughs> didn't even know that that talent existed at my age and then and you were one of the reasons as well like um because you had like you have such a rich voice and um at the time it was m- much richer of a of a tone quality and and bigger than I was used to hearing at that age. Uh-huh. You know, I was always I was always taught like, no, you know, s- sing lighter to protect your voice and mm-hmm. and um, you know, I under I understand really really what it is. You know, keep keep an eye on your repertoire choices and stuff like that. But like totally. as a student, if you have a naturally bigger voice, um, I believe it can be just as harmful to sing rep that's too light for you. And yeah, you know, you've got to yeah. find the stuff that fits. Yeah, I totally but, agree. Um, but um, Manus was the first place um, that I had been a part of that really um, embraced the fact that we can have young, big-voiced singers. And mm-hmm. so I was just like, I love big voices and I love the big rep. Like I was, I love bel canto stuff, um, light bel canto, Rossini and stuff as well. But like mm-hmm. for more of the theater aspect of it, like I, I'm an opera fan and an, and an opera singer because I love the the spectacle of like the athletic quality of of singing crazy high notes or like singing high yeah. pianissimo long breath phrases and stuff like that mm-hmm. and like viewing it you know part of what really attracts me to it is hearing these old videos of like people applauding in the middle of an aria because this one guy's high note was like just that good like old Corelli, Corelli yeah. recordings for example stuff like that that's like that's what opera is missing for me mm-hmm. today that I think you know loft and stuff is doing good you know anyway I digress. When I heard you, <laughs> <laughs> I could keep going on and on. Okay, so um, so yeah, so when I heard you, it was like the first really rich voice I heard, and like I was Kaylee Soderquist and I came from the same school, and she had a rich voice, but she was a lyric. She was yeah. not like a full totally. lyric mm-hmm. as you were. You were like um, a weight class above her, I think. Right, right. And to hear you sing Mitradi, which is what I think you had sung in that class class. Mm -hmm. at that time Mm -hmm. um it was just very impressive and I wasn't super familiar with a lot of Mozart rep anyway like just Mm -hmm. I had seen a few of his operas but um I never studied a a lot of Mozart growing up Mm -hmm. and so just to like you know start to look at things from the next level up at Manus which is what it was or Mm -hmm. a couple levels up from what I had come from um you definitely left a mark on my on my memory of oh that's so sweet of you (laughs) well I remember even um I think it was that class it was like a day or the sometime that week like you had we were all at Kaylee's apartment and we were up on the roof yeah I totally remember that I had so much fun yeah up to no good but um (laughs) (laughs) but yeah I mean I just remember reflecting on it I think Chris Colmanero was there as well or we were talking about his voice because he's Mm -hmm. a big voice as well and just just being like holy crap there's so many big voices at Manus yeah and so many good big voices at Manus Mm -hmm. and yours especially so my conclusion is that um I think what a lot of what defines or sets big voices apart, some, sometimes you hear them that, you know, big voice sopranos that aren't really refined where their chest voice some part of their aspect of their singing is, is not quite connected to the same level as everything else or connected mm-hmm. or, or whatever. So, but you had this like, you know, you had a beautiful tone quality the entire time. And a couple of times where you pop down into chest, it was, mm-hmm. um, you know, you'd start to hear yourself go lower and it's like, you know, you have this split second in, in your thought, you know, analyzing a singer like, OK, what's going to happen type of right. thing. And of course, like this ridiculous chest voice came out of you <laughs> as if you're like a, a contralto or something. So so you so. OK, so you mentioned earlier you love chest voice. So is this something yes. that you always knew you had because you were belting things earlier? Or um, is that something you tap into when you sing chess? Like because the couple of sopranos that I teach here and I've only been really a voice teacher for less than two years like Mm -hmm. I basically um I basically teach them like below f natural to just if you're going to be in chest voice just be all in chest voice as long as you have like a nice tall position like just go all the way don't um don't shy away from it and stuff because I the sopranos that I teach here tend to shy away from it totally so how do you think about chest voice um I think that I think the chest voice is a crucial part of of every singer's voice. I think like 
Um, for me, it's always something that very natural I've been, been able to do, I think because of the musical theater and because of like crossover stuff. Um, but it's almost like, particularly with the Britain that I just did, there's so much chest voice. Like I go into, ch female chorus goes into chest, like basically at every entrance. There's something, you know, chesty. Um, and I think that I like to think of it almost like speaking, um, that it's so, it's very natural to go there. And so if people over darken um, to make it sound the way that they think they want it to sound in their head, that's not real chest voice. And, and if they, if they sort of mix their two voices coming down, then it gets that breathy quality. Mm -hmm. that is also like not desirable. So basically, I mean, I think like chest voice is what I can do immediately. Like when I wake up in the morning, like that mm. is, that's like where my chest voice is. And then I worked with Dolores Zajic on it. Um, Nice. Because she was <laughs> name drop. Name drop. Yeah, I know. Oh, oh, I hate. Don't you hate it when people do that too? Like I hated my. As I said it, I averted my eyes because I was like, I hate it when people name drop. Um, but she, but she was. I mean, uh, that's a name though. Yeah. Um, she was singing Old Prioress in Dialogues of the Carmelites when I was covering New Prioress, and so I did a master class with her where I sang Senza Mamma, and then we, um, she offered to give me a lesson, and we did. Like the new Prioress aria, we did Come Scoglio. Um, we did basically everything that I have that, that goes into chess voice for a while. It's like Come Scoglio is great because it was like this huge jumps, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and basically what she says is like where your speaking voice is like very frontal, almost nasal. Like even when I'm talking to you right now, like I can feel it buzzing in my face where my speaking voice is. And so if you just place your, if you don't place, if you just sing in that and let yourself feel that resonance, let yourself feel that space, then that makes your chest voice present in a house. Like you don't have to push, it's not a lot of air, it's not a lot of pressure or volume. It's just it's just literally just like talking like I'm like I'm trying to get someone's attention across the room is basically how I think about chest voice. Um mm -hmm. and it's it's consistently been a thing that people have really liked about my singing. It's also been a thing that people have asked me if I'm a mezzo Damn near once a month, I would say someone asked me if I'm a mezzo, if I want to be a mezzo. Is <laughs> A bit. I mean, because my Tell answer. Tell me your feelings. <laughs> my, my answer is basically like, it's it's this weird combination because on the one hand, if people would hire me to be a mezzo, I would be delighted to be a mezzo. I, I like a lot of their music. I enjoy singing in my chest voice. All these things are great. But on the other hand, having a good low voice should not be what makes someone a mezzo, just as a mezzo with a good top doesn't mean she's a soprano. Like we mm -hmm. should be able to sing. I should be able to sing it in chest voice. They should be able to sing. Hi, that's just that's just a healthy voice, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think you could be like a Jesse Norman and just sing like everything <laughs> <laughs> from contralto to yes. Brunhilde. Yes. Yeah, I don't know. No. I think I think it it happens a lot. Like when people hear. You know, if they hear a, a mezzo who's got a great high C, they think, oh, like, why don't you just... And the thing is, like, for me, I don't know that I could sit in chest voice um, all night. I don't know. I the, Like, the tessitura of what would make me a great mezzo, I think I'm, like, I'm good at being a soprano. I think that's what, that's what I have. But being able to go into chest voice does not make you a mezzo, I don't think. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. It's a miscon it's like a misconception, I think. People have this idea that chest voice is um is like a mezzo quality and I think it's a quality of like any great female singer. You should be able to go into chest voice. Exactly. I mean, even just listen to Renee Fleming, she's a beautiful yeah. chest voice, you know. So yeah. I mean and she's a lyric soprano, you yeah. know, she's not a I mean she's sung some bigger things, but mm -hmm. so um you you said uh comment, you corrected yourself and said you just place it. Oh no, we don't place. Right. Mm-hmm. What do you mean by that? Well, so for me, I think um, I've had a, a couple different voice teachers. Um, and for me, the the only thing that makes me want to leave one teacher for a different teacher is that is like terminology. Like if a teacher says the word place a lot, then it changes the way that I approach singing. You know what I'm saying? So like if if a teacher says, um, OK, you're going to sing this note and like play, you want to place it in like this high and bow, then I like get 
tense and tight trying to find that spot. Whereas um, I think that so much of singing, I think basically what we're doing by going to school and stuff is we're trying to get out of all these <laughs> these habits of like overcorrecting and overproducing and over overthinking about something that's really, really natural to do. You know, like singing is not, singing is just like, I mean, it's it's one of the first things that we do as kids, right? We like, we talk and then we like hum and sing little songs. Like it, it's just, it's a natural thing. Uh, and so this idea of like placing a sound makes you tense and tight or makes me really tense and tight um, in a way that doesn't make me make a good sound and doesn't make me sing in a, in a way that's healthy. So just, hi, my puppy wants to play. <laughs> That's okay. Give me my headphones We like back. Frankie. That's okay. We like Frankie. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would agree. I think um, I only, I took my voice to like, or my technique to the next level once um, I abandoned the whole concept of placement, you know, yeah. singing the mask and stuff. And um, Arthur has a way with, because that's what I studied with, Mm-hmm. has a way with um using like real estate or like spatial references to understand mm-hmm. your voice and what he said to me which like you know it's probably not the best analogy like but it was clear to me at the time where like um you know I was talking about like you know don't I want to like feel it in the mask and stuff like that and he was trying to get me to sing really deep because I was singing with a high larynx to try and uh-huh. you know get everything get forward the- basically Oof, yep. exactly which is what you know which is like why I didn't have any high notes until I was like 22 mm-hmm. and whatever. And everyone was like, you're a tenor. You just can't sing above G. Anyway, once, <laughs> once yeah, exactly. And so, um, but then once, uh, you know, the, the, the thing that I'll always remember is, is he was like, look, when you have an apartment next to the train tracks and the train goes by your windows and your windows shake, mm-hmm. do you shake your windows before the train comes? Or does the train have to come and then the window shake? And so I was like, okay, so the throat has to be in the right position. Right. And then maybe I'll feel it, you know. And mm-hmm. he, he's like, you may feel it in your ass. You may not feel it in your face. You got to get your throat right. So anyway, so I, I thought, that. and that's that's like the worst impression of him. But like, that's basically what he said. Uh, I, don't, I, I'm I terrible connected with, with it and I loved it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and so, yeah, I, I love a fellow non-placement yeah. <laughs> singer well, you know because I, I, think I think it's so true. A big... Uh, it's not it's not a bad thing about singers it's just a, sort of a common trait that we all share is that what we want to do is we want to be artistic and we want to give and we want um we want to be expressive and so if someone is telling us this is the way to be expressive like we just we i think that singers tend to overreact to the terminology that's used because we want to we so badly want to do what our teachers want us to do. We so badly want to do mm-hmm. what our, make the sounds that our coaches want us to make. And so if someone says, oh, it needs to be more forward, you like put your mouth in your nose and you like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like everything goes up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's just because we want, we hear that sound and we react to the, yeah. the words that they're using. So mm-hmm. it's just, I, I think it can be like a dangerous um, path to go down that mm-hmm. I, re- I really respect voice teachers who will find 10 different ways to say the same thing because mm-hmm. if it's just there's only one way to describe it which is like placement then you're gonna get you're gonna get this sound and you're gonna create like a tense singer you know it's mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. like diana sobiero who is um like one of the teachers at the kennedy center and like who i predominantly study with my favorite thing about her is like she's super nitpicky like she's super um she like won't let you sing a phrase without changing something but um she'll find 10 different ways to describe what it is she wants or to describe the way to get you would to do it you know like so it's not it's not oh you're just not here's a perfect example i had a voice teacher i will not say her name but i had a voice teacher that i specifically asked how do i do a trill because i was doing drill song from faust how do I do a trill? And this was a woman who could absolutely do a trill. And she went, honey, you just, ah, and just did a trill. How do I, how do I do a trill? That's not, <laughs> like, that's not, you doing one is not going to make give me the ability to do it. 
um, you need, you need to have someone who can like explain things to you and not just in the one way that works for them. So I think singers make excellent voice teachers if they can find different ways to explain things because singers sometimes just can only describe it the way that they feel it or the way they do it. And mm -hmm. so if, if you're a singer, like Diana was a singer, an amazing singer who can find all these different ways to connect and she can work with people of all different voice types because of that. Whereas like if you're, if you're a soprano and you can only describe things a certain way, probably you're only going to teach people who sing the same ref that you did. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. I had a, um, I had a voice teacher in undergrad who was great for so many things. And especially because she was adamant that um, you need to cater yourself to the type of learner your students are. And, and no student is just one type of learner. But mm -hmm. she basically said there are three kind, main, you know, main three classes of learners. There's kinesthetic learners. So it's like it feels like this. Right. There's visual learners. Imagine it looks like this. And there are yeah. aural learners. Go for this sound. The sound. And so mm -hmm. she would always explain every concept in all three, regardless of whether she knew you were predominantly one type. And I thought it was so helpful because even if I was a visual and a kinesthetic learner, she would still mm -hmm. explain the RL part to me and it would just help triangulate literally the, the connection I needed to make. And mm -hmm. like, while I only studied with her for a year at that time, I'm sure I could have gotten a lot further, but, um, you know, there she was great for at least very fundamental concepts and, yeah. and using that and that's the that's one thing that um i think i'll always do as a voice teacher is is use that aspect because i think it's really important and sometimes you don't know what kind of learner your student is so you just have to spit all three at least at them and as many totally. other analogies and things that you can at the same time mm -hmm. i totally so agree with that. so along with this chest voice thing um how it's related to your head voice basically or let's call them it makes it sound like i don't know what i'm talking about when your chest register and your head register <laughs> um, <laughs> let's call them registers um so you have this um when i hear your well sopranos sing like 85 percent of the time in their head register you know mm -hmm. above f sharp yes. basically yes and um when I hear your voice, you have a really great balance. You have a very unique um, tone quality that's very beautiful because you, you have such because you have such an extreme of the two halves. You have like a very bright vowel at times, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you always maintain this really warm timbre underneath all the time. Oh, thank you. So, yeah, I mean, I'm you know, I only, I'm sure a lot of people. <laughs> I don't have a lot of people that listen to this, but I'm sure that some of the people that listen to this are like, you know, he just compliments his singers all the time. It's because I only get on singers that I really enjoy. So <laughs> I, <laughs> so I, I talk to the ones that I want to learn something from myself basically. So, <laughs> um, but you have this, um, you have a unique, I would call it a position that you do like, um, you know, just when you're vocalizing, whether it's doesn't matter what vowel it is, but you have this, this underlying tone quality mm -hmm. that allows you to my ear to maintain a really bright um clear let's call it clear vowel mm -hmm. um as well as maintain a really warm tone mm -hmm. so like wh when i interviewed theo lebeau we were talking about balancing the soft palate and the larynx and he was like to me it's kind of like if i have too much soft palate it would be like C or if yeah. I have too much low larynx it would be like C right, right. and you need like you need the in between the C so mm -hmm. um is that sort of like do you think of things in terms of soft talent and larynx or is this something you know you talked about singing as being natural and you know I equate that as everything needs to be balanced that we don't go too far in one direction type right. of a thing mm -hmm. but at the same time to my ear it sounds like you're going to the extreme of the chiato and the extreme of the scudo at the same time. So mm -hmm. no matter how far you go, you're still fully in balance. Mm -hmm. You just have a bigger voice, like a bigger right. teeter totter, basically. Yeah. That's how I look at it. <laughs> so I'm just describing your voice. How would you like describe <laughs> the way that you think of your own tone quality? Like, do you, is there a thought that goes in your head that like you need to achieve a certain color for it to be um, right that day? Or I think that, um, so I think like the way that I sing, like the tone of my voice is just kind of like 
it just, it is what it is. You know, like that, that's kind of when I started singing, it was always some degree, like what it sounds like now. It was just like less polished, less refined. I had less of a fucking clue what I was doing, but, um, I have this. <laughs> Frankie's just, on camera. <laughs> it's the worst dog ever. Oh, she's cute though. <laughs> And she loves you. So that's all. She loves you. That's all that matters. That's the only thing that matters. Um, anyway, so I have this teacher right now. Um, her name is Betsy Bishop. She was Fricka in the production of of The Ring that we did. And she is like Virginia based. Like she lives around here all year long. So anyway, so what she she heard me do this this concert because her husband is like one of the head coaches here. Um, and she heard me do this concert and we started studying together and she said basically everything that you're saying about like the, the balance that my voice has and like the tone quality. And she said, and the one thing you don't want to become is a caricature of the things that people like about your voice. So she was like, when, when people hear you and the thing that people like about you is they like that you have this warm, rich tone and that you can sing high and you can sing low. And they like your chest voice and things like that. And she was like, and what you don't want to become is this like over dark, over warm sound digging into chest voice, like trying because we're performers. And so we to want get, you to like us. We're trying to yeah, please you to give um, more of what you of what people like. Basically. Exactly. So I yeah. think that that's kind of why I like, for example, I warm up uh, uh, exclusively on E on an E vowel, um, like both all like all the way to the top of my register and all the way through my chest voice um because it gets i find especially if i have to do coloratura that it gets me feeling uh like the light buoyancy that i don't feel because my voice can get dark that i don't feel if i'm doing a darker vowel so i do a really bright vowel um and then that helps and i'm i just feel weird saying to you like and another voice teacher told me but Alan Held, who is another one of my like sort of semi voice teachers, I gotta just, write down all these names you've been dropping. In just this. <laughs> dropping every single name. I want to. I want a graphic when you make this a video of just like every name that I drop, and then me. We start them with off. Carrie Ann, and then we zigzag through all these voice teachers. Disgusting. And it's then the we worst. get. And then we get back to Carrie Ann again. <laughs> <laughs> so Alan says that um, you put everything sort of almost through like a, like a prism, of one vowel which i think is a really interesting way to line everything up right so so what he does is he does everything through like this prism of like an oo vowel um so like he's still doing like like pure vowels but everything is going is how it relates like an ah vowel how it relates to an oo vowel and so for me mm -hmm. i do everything how it relates to to an e vowel or like a tall like an i vowel mm -hmm. um so that that way my Ah uh, doesn't get to uh, all. It doesn't like fall back mm -hmm. because I, I mm -hmm. still keep that. For me, it's more, I, I would say, like a mental thing. Um, like how you were saying, like Theo is physically balancing things. That's how he pictures like the physical balance. Um, for me, I, I orally picture the balance, I would say, like that all my vowels need to match up so nothing jumps out um, of the line. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. I know that it's something that I've struggled with, particularly my ah vowel. Is the... She's just the worst. She stresses me out. <laughs> it, because it, because it, uh, your ah vowel tends to fall too far back sometimes? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, and in, in a way has... that, like, becoming a character of my own voice, right? In a way that to me, it sounds super like just taking a bath in hot chocolate like it sounds like warm and luscious and wonderful and to the audience it sounds like Ooh! right yeah okay i'm <laughs> i'm sure that's an extreme perception you might have developed but but it gets the picture across <laughs> Good. okay so so but but to counteract um this issue that you think you have with your ah vowel because i don't think you have it but <laughs> this this issue that you think uh you have with your ah vowel you're you say like in coloratura you think more of a brighter ah or more towards the i or the, mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. did you say i or a or e or something yeah like um like in particular i'll try to yeah just kind of shape it 
because an eval equally can go too far too far forward if I if I'm like spreading an eval. So it's mm-hmm. a combination of like e and i, like mm-hmm. and tall i. I like that a lot because yeah. um, the like what the Garcia school, which is super old school Italian, yes. he used Garcia is amazing used, though. I know, and he um, what I like. I forget the Alan something. The guy you were just talking Alan about Held? the prison. Yeah, so um, I like his ooh vowel thing because Garcia stressed the importance of ooh in the throat, mm. maintaining the ooh position in the throat because That's so cool. ooh is really easy to have a low larynx with or mm-hmm. a low relaxed suspended larynx. However you think the larynx is supposed to be, it definitely shouldn't be up and ooh keeps it in a nice position. So, mm-hmm. um, But then um, he also talks about using like uh, the a vowel to through like to sing to get the clarity of the rest of your vowels to basically mm-hmm. sing those through a prism of a eh, yeah which is very close to i and I so if that. you're maintaining ooh in the throat and a in the mouth basically mm-hmm. then it goes from being ah to ah uh-huh. you know Good for sounds. example which i think is very cool yeah mm-hmm. so it i basically think is is the same thing so but but like for example are there parts of your range where um you don't need to think about it as much, or are you constantly thinking about this balance on an ah vowel whenever it happens, whether it's chest voice or a high C? What I tend to do is um, I focus a lot on vowels and stuff when I'm warming up, because, um, like for me, I think that that when I'm warming up, if I warm up the right way, then I don't think about technique at all when I'm performing or auditioning, then I can just like perform. If I didn't warm up enough, then my audition or my performance becomes like a warm up and it's not good sing. It's not the way that I like to sing. Mm -hmm. Um, So just like with this Rape of Lucretia that we did, like I would get to the, I would have like, let's say a a call two hours before the show started. I would get there an hour before then and warm up and sing through um, like the whole role by myself. Um, before anybody got there. And so then by the time I was going on stage to do it, it was just, I, the only thing I had to wor- think about was performing and like the acting and all that stuff. Um, That's interesting because, did you do that with all of your roles or is that just a, a female chorus thing? I tend to, yeah, I'm trying to think of any role that I haven't done that with. Um, like essentially you're saying you sing through the role twice on a performance night yeah mm-hmm. so pre- did so, you hear did you get that did you steal that idea from someone else or is that just something that you do oh you know that if there was a name to drop i would drop it but i'm gonna drop just carrie ann on that one. Oh, okay all right well i teed you up for it so <laughs> good job so so this is something that you just do then and you're mm-hmm. essentially saying that you sing whatever operatic role you're doing twice in a performance night yes but an important thing about this is that when I sing it the first time, um, it is almost like it's it's marking in the octave. It's so like I warm up, mm. I do like like a really solid like twenty minutes of of warming up and doing in like coloratura. Um, like I, I basically the coloratura ex- exercises that I do are like I take things out of I sing like Tache la Notte Placida from Trovatore. And, uh, and like comiscolio and things like that, things that have coloratory sections in them. And I just do them on different uh, notes of a scale going up and then, you know, mm-hmm, down. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so I do like a really good warm up and then I will sing through like female chorus. I did like Despina. I did like the witch and Hansel and Gretel and I'll sing through the whole thing like sort of um, without giving it my full body of sound. Um, and I, for me, it puts my mind at ease because in in a lot of the roles that I have to do, I'll have to delicately approach something. And so if I know that I've already done that, um, I never worry about making a big sound. Mm-hmm. I worry about um, do I have the support to, to do these things delicately. So singing through the whole thing beforehand, it's just a thing that puts my mind at ease. Um, so that I know, specifically with Rape of Lucretia, that it... Um, there are re- these really delicate middle voice sections that you just want to sing with almost like a like a purity to them, and so doing that in a really simplistic way that that is not clouded by all this like 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 big sound or or big vibrato or anything, um, just sort of making it bare bones and stripping it down. 
um, then I know I can add a little bit more voice to it in performance and it'll be a good balance. Hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Very interesting. <laughs> That's, um, I, I mean, I'm not doing much performing, but I might start thinking of things a little differently based on that. Mm -hmm. Cause that seems to make a lot of sense yeah. for me just cause my voice has gotten bigger, especially since I started at Manus and yeah. I knew what it meant to open my voice basically to uh -huh. access all parts of it. Uh -huh. I was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe I shouldn't be singing Rossini. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, few people should um, be singing Rossini in my professional opinion. <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> But, you know, Rossini got me my high notes. And mm -hmm. then from there, it was like, okay, I shouldn't be singing this stuff because it's like kind of fake, high, weird larynx singing. Yeah, yeah. And then, you were like but, cheating uh, to do it. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a lot of food for thought. So I think it's time for the opera quiz. <laughs> 